I was thinking about um, the question that often comes to mind as practitioners. You know, how do we know when we're enlightened? How do we know when we are realized or awakened? And many different teachers try to explain it in many different ways, but I think the one that I found very succinct and very um, useful is the one by Ramana Maharishi where he says, you know when you're not thinking anymore. And, uh, and then it just reminds me of the all the times I've been engaged in teaching meditation and people say, well, how am I supposed to stop the thoughts? How do you stop the thinking? And this perception of meditation being the stopping of the thoughts. So then we have this great teacher telling us, well, you know that you've achieved enlightenment when at all times there's no thinking taking place. And then when you have somebody who's new to the practice asking you, well, how do you stop the thoughts? It seems to be a very big divide and gap, a long path between that person who is just starting out and what has been spoken about as having no thoughts. And then it occurred to me that I think the emphasis or the way it's interpreted is um, sometimes what can catch us. Because we don't stop thinking. We don't actually stop thinking. It's impossible for us to stop thinking. We can't do that. It's not within our power to stop thinking. Thinking stops. That's possible. Thinking can stop. But we don't do it. And that's where the hiccup is, or the challenge is. Because we are not able to stop thinking. And so we need to look at, well, if thinking stops, yet we're not able to stop it, what do we actually mean by all of this? And it brings us back to the idea that we're in control of something. That we're able to make this thing happen. This stopping of thoughts. Who is this we? Who is the I that's making this thing happen? I stop my thoughts. I, st I stop my thoughts. As opposed to thoughts stop. Thoughts just stop. And so there's a disjunct, a uh, divide between the two. And it can be a divide which can take us a long time to realize. Because in essence, it shifts everything. It shifts the whole perspective on what our practice is about. If we sit down to practice thinking that I am going to stop my thinking, then we're setting ourselves up for a very frustrated practice and ongoing practice and experience in the whole endeavor. Whereas if we can acknowledge that thinking stops, it does stop. It can happen. But I'm not the one who just, I'm not the one who can do it. And so who does it? Who stops the thinking? What we can do is we can facilitate are creating circumstances or conditions for thinking to stop. We can go about creating an environment where thinking is more likely to stop. And that's the best we can do, is to create the stage, so to speak, for the show of um, thoughtless existence to be experienced. And if we're going to do that, we have to use our willpower. We have to use our focus, what we might call our intellect. It's our intellect that's going to give us the capacity to actually go about creating those conditions. Now, the intellect, we can think of it as being our conscious awareness in its state of knowingness, attentiveness, and 
its role as the observer. That's our intellect. And it's our intellect. We're using that part of us to direct our um, practice and what we do so as to facilitate creating circumstances or conditions which will, if it goes according to what is suitable for us, it'll arrive at a point of where thinking stops. So we don't do it, but it can happen. Now, when we talk about the intellect, this part of us becomes fragmented. This capacity to actually implement this, this part, this capacity to create these circumstances or these conditions. We have this capacity, but it, it's fragmented. We use our intellect as human beings engaging in the world. We use our intellect using um, our thought processes in a collected, coherent, comprehensive, useful way. When we're engaging in something, we engage our thought processes, our thinking capacity, so that we can go about doing whatever task it is that we're trying to do. And so our intellect incorporates or it employs um, the mind to carry out thinking in a way which is going to help it to achieve its aim. And we can think of this as primary thinking or a primary thinking process, the, the foundation of thinking as being a tool for the intellect to be able to ensure that it is engaging in the world in the way that it wants to engage. This is our primary thinking processes. And this is all fine, but these primary thinking processes sometimes break away from the intellect. And at this point, these primary thinking processes are more related to the deep mind. And you'll know this from your just a simple reflection on your day to day experience that you are focused and engaging your thinking processes in an activity. And sometimes your mind will go into another space, got nothing to do with the task at hand. Instead, it's the primary thinking processes engaging in memory and previous experience. So the primary thinking processes are at the behest or at their at the um, call of the intellect. The in, they're the intellect's tool, but they can sneak away, and they can sneak into the depths of the mind and disregard the intellect if the intellect is not paying attention. And so we refer to these processes as primary thinking processes. But there's another aspect which is at play. And this is the aspect of our thinking, which is holding our primary thinking processes to task. It's not the intellect. Intellect is just a mechanism which is uh, looking at the situation, is applying focus, and then is utilizing our thinking processes to achieve the task. But there's another process of thinking, we can call it the secondary processes of thinking, which are related to measuring how well the primary processes of thinking are doing. So these secondary processes of thinking are almost like a law that we've put in place to say and to call out how well the primary thinking processes are doing. So you can imagine this as a kind of um, um, an experience where you're engaged in a task and the intellect is using the primary thinking processes so that you can carry out that task. And then this other process of thinking, secondary processes of thinking, come into play and they start going, you're not doing that right. That's not the way you did it. You did it better the last time. And it, you know, in some circles, it's called um, the inner critic. But I think we have to be careful not to simplify this too much, because inner critic that denotes one thing. But this process is 
ever present and it's not always critical but it is always engaging itself with the primary thinking processes so the secondary thinking processes exist because of the primary thinking processes the second thing secondary thinking processes um, gain their power and their weight and their significance and importance in how much they're able to call out the primary thinking processes. Oh, good job. You did that well. You did that better than the last time. You're really improving. Oh, I wouldn't have done it like that. Mm, I'm not sure about that. And you, you have an idea of what I'm talking about. It's a, a you know, the experience of it is so visceral and so alive within us throughout the day. For me to be able to give a simple um, rendition of it is it kind of it, it doesn't match up because just the intensity which this can take place sometimes we can be walking down the street our intellect has as its focus as its objective our willpower is being directed from going from a to b and we're engaging our primary thinking processes uh, maybe to some level to avoid certain things that it might be on along the way to say hello to certain people whatever it might be that is going on but then the secondary thinking processes engage the primary thinking processes and create a whole narrative which is all about how well the primary thinking processes are doing and so this dialogue takes place this a dynamic, this interaction between the primary thinking processes and the secondary thinking processes, where the two can be seen almost like a couple. They're bouncing off each other. There's a dynamic between them. And the dynamic that they share has nothing to do with the intellect. It hasn't been uh, employed by the intellect. It's got no consideration for the intellect. It's got no use to the intellect. It's not for the intellect. Yet it's something that can take place. And so these two bickering siblings, you might say, or these two um, friends who are continuously falling out, or this romantic couple, if you want to go with that metaphor, who have their moments of joy where they meet and they kind of agree on things, but have many, many turbulent moments when they don't agree on things. That's what is going on in our minds, the relationship between the primary and the secondary thinking processes. Now these secondary thinking processes, they act as a kind of police, a law, a superior agent within our psyche, which is kind of calling us out on things. Calling, when I say us, I'm talking about calling out the primary thinking processes. And this is where we have to be careful with our pronouns. <laughs> um, so this secondary thinking process is a type of law and it's imposing standards, standards on how we should be engaging in the primary thinking processes. That's all it's doing. That's all it can do is put down a standard for the primary thinking processes to uphold. Now, this standard that it's got, that it's has created, this standard, where does it come from? We, we've allowed ourselves to take on these secondary thinking processes, which are calling out the primary thinking processes and the primary thinking processes we have to remember are fundamentally to assist the intellect in achieving whatever it is that it needs to achieve. And so these standards that the secondary um, thinking processes are, are laying out, where have these come from? And in a nutshell, we can say they've come from cultural norms, social norms, socially accepted behaviors, um, you know, the supervision we received as children growing up, um, school rooms, all these kind of things. The voices of many different people and their thoughts and their fears and their projections that we've inherited more, uh, morphed into our own thinking and then... Um, readapted them, reframed them, and worked them into our own thinking processes, our own secondary thinking processes. And so all of these are at hand. So the intellect, 
that part of us which is able to just focus, that part of us which is able to just be aware of what's taking place, on certain occasions needs to employ thinking. It's, it's just, it's its tool. And that's what the tool is for, to help the intellect to achieve a task. The secondary thinking processes come into action. And they, as I've mentioned already, take their power from how much they're able to torment and pick at and engage the primary thinking processes. So there's this dialogue, this continuous bickering, which is going on between the two um, thinking processes. And I was uh, trying to think of a situation in, in our day-to-day -day experience where this could be represented. And I remember one time living in a household where I would be just at home cooking, doing something, and the house would be relatively quiet, except for whatever was going on in the street, and usually just in quiet. And then my housemate would come home. The first thing he'd do is he'd turn on the TV, and he might watch it for two or three minutes. Um, and then he'd leave that room and go into another room and turn on the radio. And he'd be doing something in whatever it was, his bedroom or whatever the room it was, and then he'd come into the kitchen. And he might turn on another radio. And so there's all of this noise which is being created. And this noise is going to be pulling at my own capacity to focus on what I'm doing. But the noise is going on. It's, it's something that's taking place. And my capacity to focus on what I'm doing will be assisted or supported to the degree that I don't give attention to all this other noise. And when I say don't give attention to all this other noise, it's, it's the secondary thinking processes which are going to kick in because my intellect is saying, okay, stay focused. And so it might engage the primary thinking processes. Okay, you're chopping the onion, you're doing this, you're doing that. And, you know, and these are very subtle thinking processes, but they're part of just what's going on. But there's going to be a part of the secondary thinking processes which are going to say, but what about that noise? Shouldn't you do something about that noise? How do you expect to focus and cook the way you usually cook with all that noise? And it starts to kick in. And then those primary thinking processes say, no, but I can do this. I can do this. I can still stay focused. I, I, you know, I, I've cooked for many people before. I can do this. It's all right. And then this secondary thinking process goes, I'm not sure. And so the narrative goes on and this dialogue goes on. And where is the intellect at this point? The intellect has been clouded over. There's no capacity to pay attention to what's going on because now there's so much internal dialogue. There's a whole drama taking place between the primary and secondary thinking processes, which leaves no capacity for the intellect to be acknowledged. And so what we're trying to appreciate really is that in, in our meditation practice, when we sit down, where we go about this whole process of moving into a space which allows us to experience beingness. Well, beingness is the intellect insofar as it's going to require our clarity of focus, our one-pointed attentiveness to be able to stay in a space where it's not being pulled out by the processes of the mind. And the processes of the mind, as we've just said, are those primary and secondary thinking processes. Initially, in our meditation practice, we may incorporate the primary thinking processes to help us as a kind of tool. And so we may, like we did in our current practice, we did a type of body scan, and we may talk ourselves, or we may use our thinking processes to guide that, that, the primary thinking processes, to guide that process. So our intellect is saying, okay, I want to focus on the body. I want to focus on the different parts of the body. And then it's saying, okay, primary thinking processes help me to do that. And so there's maybe some kind of internal narration, internal commentary, which is helping to support that. But we have to be careful because once that 
kicks into play, once the primary thinking processes come into play, there's always a capacity then for the secondary thinking processes to react and interact and engage with them. So initially in our meditation practice, we might use techniques like mantra, we might use the body scan, whatever technique we use. But all these techniques, they require the intellect to be in command. And they, we can say that they require a certain degree of thinking, of um, internal dialogue to, uh, to allow it to happen. Even if we think of regulating the breath, when we're regulating the breath, we, we may be using mantra. And mantra is a type of primary thinking process. We're using words to articulate what's going on so that we are um, able to stay focused on our objective, which is just to stay focused. And then with regulation of the breath, it can be similar where we're counting or we're um, chanting or we are just simply staying very alert to the process in a manner where we might need some subtle thought processes to guide it. We may or may not. The challenge for us when we sit down to do that is that when we are engaging in a task, the primary thinking processes, if our intellect is very sharp and very alert, it will ensure that those primary thinking processes stay on board. But as we mentioned, the primary thinking processes can sometimes get into memory, sometimes get into previous experience and start going down that route. And that can happen in our meditation practice. We might be using a technique, and next thing you know, we're remembering something from the day, or we're remembering something from just before we sat down to meditate, or some memory of whatever kind. Or it could be the last time that you heard somebody uh, talking about something with the breath, or whatever. Something comes into the mind. And that's the point when the secondary thinking processes are really, really going to um, find an advantage because once the primary thinking processes start going down that route of not simply doing their job to, uh, to the benefit of the intellect, now they've kind of found their own little playfulness, then the secondary thinking processes are going to have something to work with. And so that memory pops in and the primary thinking processes and they say, oh yeah, I did this yesterday, this technique that went really well yesterday. Or it might not even be like that. It might just be that, um, you're doing the mantra, uh, maybe it's so hum, and you're using so hum mantra and you're doing it. And then there's a memory of a teacher or a memory of a space where you practiced it before. And then the secondary thinking processes might say, but you'll never be like that teacher. Or this is going to take you a long time. Why are you doing it? Or why don't you be, why, why are you getting distracted with this thought? Lots of different things. And so what we're trying to appreciate, I feel, which might be of benefit, is the fact that there are two types of thinking processes and one nurtures the other. So it's like a couple where there's fighting that can take place. And for us to feel like we can go in and stop it, what came to my mind when I was thinking about this was it's like what we see in the world today, where we see one group take arms so as to stop another group from taking arms. And it's fighting fire with fire. It's not going to lead to the result that is anticipated. What's the best way to go about it? What's the best way about stopping this engagement that's taking place? The best way to stop it is to drop all arms, to let go of the, the of the very mechanisms, the very tools, the very implements, the weaponry that is going to aggravate it. So in terms of the secondary thinking processes in relation to the primary thinking processes, our techniques are useful. Our techniques are useful, but we have to ensure that we are using them with the intellect, that the intellect is employing the technique. And the technique then will serve as a kind of protection, a protection from the, this bickering that goes on. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is for the intellect to stand alone as the intellect, 
to be one-pointed, focused, alert, and attentive without any tool. It's dropped all tools. It's let them all go. And in that way, then, when it's let go of all tools, when it's let go of everything, there's going to be no primary thinking processes taking place. And if there's no primary thinking processes taking place, there can be no secondary processes taking place. Neither is being engaged. Now, we talked about it in terms of me uh, the meditation technique, where the technique in itself is a type of primary thinking process. And that's okay as, as using it as a safeguard. We want to be able to defend ourselves. But ultimately, we want to get to a point where we don't need to even rely on it to defend ourselves. We are just not engaging in it. We've dropped all arms and we've stepped away. And I liken this to maybe, you know, when you see, you see it with parents sometimes, two siblings are bickering over something, primary and secondary um, thought, thinking processes. They're bickering, bickering with each other. And then the parent just remains objective. They can't go in and take a side. What are they going to do? It's not always the case, but it's just as for the sake of a, an example. Or it might be that you, you have two people bickering on the street. You can go in and try and say, well, no, this and that. And you can try and take up arms and try and fight it. But what are you actually doing? You're actually just giving more into it. You're fueling whatever is taking place. Now, the example isn't perfect, <laughs> um, but I, I think... The emphasis is to be put on how by dropping your arms, by letting go, by stepping back, then there's a capacity for this engaging, which is taking place between these two processes, the primary and secondary processes, it can just fall away. It just, it has nothing to uh, support itself. And so what this comes down to then is our paying attention. Fundamentally, that's what it comes down to. We can talk about intellect in terms of focus, willpower, one-pointed attention. But in day-to-day -day terms, it's paying attention, paying attention to what's going on. Now, when we talk about that in relation to our life, you know, a very um, kind of common uh, reaction is, you know, well, sometimes I uh, forget stuff or sometimes I hit my leg off a chair uh, when, I'm, when I'm walking around but is this me not paying attention? This is this kind of stuff is distracting from what we're really trying to pay attention to. What we're really that kind of stuff is more, you know, it's it's trivial to, compared to what we're trying to actually focus on. What we're trying to focus on when we talk about paying attention is thought processes, the thinking mechanisms at play. This primary mechanism in relation to the secondary me mechanism. So as an exercise, what I would put out there is, you know, we've got our formal meditation practice and you can go on doing that as you're doing. And maybe this exercise will be useful in terms of your formal meditation practice. But even in terms of your day to day experience, you know, there's moments in the day when you're sitting around, when stuff goes on, when you're just having dinner, where there's you notice your own thinking. You have this capacity to reflect on your own thinking. You know that you're thinking. Maybe somebody's having a conversation over here and you know there's this stuff going through your mind. Or you're sitting on the bus and you know there's stuff going through your mind. When that stuff is going through your mind and you're at a point where you're already aware that there's stuff going through your mind, drop all arms. And what dropping all arms means is you see the two mechanisms bickering. You see them engaging one off the other. Well, you see, and, the, and the, you know, the primary mechanism says, oh, um, it's great that they're talking. And the secondary mechanism says, why would you think that? You never thought that. You never liked that person. And then, the, you know, there's this kind of bickering that goes on between the two of them. And then you're there, intellect and this capacity of the buddhi, the capacity to see through it. And you say, I'm just paying attention. Now, you're not trying to stop it. You're not trying to stop it. Trying to stop it means that you're going to have to engage in those processes. You're going to have to either use the primary thinking process or the secondary th thinking process. You can't. You can't fight fire with fire. So what you do is you see them both taking place, you see it going on, and you pay attention. And in the paying attention, watch what will happen. Because if you're really paying attention, then you're not picking a side. 
You're not going with the primary process or the secondary process. You're not picking a side. You're just paying attention. And there's these, these processes which you're observing and which are taking place, they might not be comfortable. You may not want them. You may want to free yourself from them. But every action you do is going to be an act of aggression. It's going to be an assault. It's going to be an attack. It's going to be something which is going to fuel this dialogue even more. So you need to put down all arms. You need to drop your weapons. You need to step back and you just pay attention. And in the paying attention, there's, there's nobody watching. There's nobody there to fuel this dialogue. And so the actors go off stage. They don't find any reason for being there. And then that paying attention just becomes you observing beings. Now, maybe it might presenting it like this, it can sound very easy, um, but it's not. It's a practice, and that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to do that in both our meditation and in our informal practice. But uh, as a task, or as an exercise, or as a, a way to maybe just reflect on the processes of the mind, I'd encourage you, the next time that you're just sitting around and you notice your mind going into something, the reason and the only way that these thought processes are ever going to exist is because they're playing off each other. They're bouncing off each other. They're engaging each other so as to keep the drama going. There's two actors at play. And you can try and take away one actor, but the only way you're going to try and take one away one actor is by using the other actor. So it's an aggressive approach. Your approach needs to be that of the passive act. And the passive act is just to let go, surrender, pay attention, and then just see what happens.